Campbell. There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my StreamYard virtual studio with a three timer. Ryan Smith, who is the founder of True Diagnostic and the co-founder or former founder of TaylorMade. What's up, bro? How are you, man? Yeah, doing well. Thanks for uh, having me again. It's good to be back. It's been a while. It has been a while. It's an honor. So uh, I was actually the first podcaster to interview Ryan way back when. Dude, was it 2017? I think it might have even been 2016. To be it might have been 2016. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really uh, yeah. seven years ago. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. When they were blowing up at uh, Taylor Made for in the peptide world. So a lot of the guys and people, gals and guys and gals that watch this show, you guys know Ryan. Of course, you're very familiar with him. He's one of the leading minds on the planet in peptides. Uh, anybody who knows anything about peptides in the clinical space knows Ryan, has spoke with Ryan, has probably listened to Ryan lecture. So it's always an honor to have you here. Uh, on the show. But of course, today we're talking about your new company, which is, again, a revolutionary technology. I wrote about you guys, of course, in the new peptides book, uh, which is called True Diagnostic. And it really is the creme de la creme of epigenetic testing and understanding of, you know, our biological age of like, you know, we're not chronologically aging, you're, you're, you're aging based on the level of your cells. And, you know, what, what are the bioenergetics of your cells as you get older, again, chronologically, and hopefully not biologically. So we're going to be talking a lot about that today. Um, so anyway, uh, he's again, the founder of TaylorMade guys and the current founder of True Diagnostic. But Ryan, let me just ask you, because uh, you're the guy to ask, and, 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 I'm, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here a little bit, but the space right now of allopathic medicine, we know sick care, illness medicine is dying. The last three years is, you know, proof positive of what is happening. You know, there's this massive bifurcation. More and more people are coming to guys like you and your company, even people like me as an influencer in the business, you know, asking like, how can I learn more about optimization versus, you know, managing my and treating my symptoms of disease? Where do you see this bifurcation going from here? Like, do you see sick care and the current, you know, subreg subrogated insurance model complete, completely collapsing in the next two to five years? You know, it, it, without, I, I would say, I hope so, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I yeah. think that uh, yeah. for, uh, we talked about some of my, my entrepreneurial background, but before that, you know, I was in, you know, in medical school, I, you know, I was yeah. doing the, the clinical rounds and, and that was one of the reasons I left. That's the reason, one of the reasons I hated it is because it was just taking care of disease, right? Following a, a relatively formulaic approach to treating people who were maybe too past gone already, right? And 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 I think that that was emotionally very difficult. But I think that it just proves the system is broken. And and that's when we got into the compounding pharmacy, this preventative integrative medicine space. And I actually got hope back because I I didn't actually know it was even happening before I did that. Um, and so uh, so I think that you know my my vision of this goes back to actually sort of our company and aging because you know age itself is the number one biggest risk factor for all chronic disease and death and we're starting to see now that we can measure that appropriately for people who are not sick it is the biggest risk factor you want to manage but it also beyond that can be tied to outcome data and so now you what you're sort of doing with this type of testing is providing a little bit of a, a counter argument for things like insurers to sort of predict these outcomes and so if we can get really good at predicting these outcomes then we can shift the way the money flows to to prevention-based diagnostics um, with these good predictive tools rather than just treating sick care medicine. And so when I say I hope it fails, I'm hoping that we, you know, it, 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 the traditional model fails and, and more people start to do these, you know, advanced biomarker detection systems to keep people healthy while they're still healthy. I think, well said, I think it has to. I mean, you would get a lot of people in the, you know, mainstream, you know, allopathic community say, oh, that's not true. It'll, the bifurcation will just get deeper. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like the people that, you know, choose to, again, externalize their health again to the cheapest $40 a month copayment to the guys like us who will fucking spend any amount of money yeah. to short, to, you know, live longer and stronger. So, I mean, maybe that's truly what it is, but you're right, man. I mean, it's more of a hope 
I mean, it's so broken though. Yeah. And- I mean, look, man, my mom, I think I was telling you this in a text message recently, but my mom was just in a hospital for COVID. Now my mom is comorbid. She has, you know, every bad thing. She's you know, been morbidly obese for a long time, you know, inactive, but I witnessed what just she went through and she's at Emory in Atlanta, like one of the best, mm-hmm. you know, my mom and dad are well off and dude, it is a, it's a death trap. I mean, literally getting old and going through the system now, it's unreal what is going on, but I just don't see people like from our generation. And of course you're a little bit younger than me, but I don't see how people from us are going to go down that path, bro. Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, I, it, it is sort of that bifurcation is happening from a money perspective, but I think that totally. people from, from definitely our generation, uh, are have, if they have the money, I think that their approach is very different and they're willing to spend yeah. on it rather than yeah. just sort of accepting the, uh, the, the narratives I think of the traditional medicine system, which I think yeah. is a great thing, but I, I definitely think that, uh, yeah, the bifurcation as it relates to income might be the, the driving issue, which is unfortunate. It's funny because you're right. The narrative for our parents and maybe not your parents because your parents are just a little bit older than me, but over that, they, they listen to the doctor. Yeah. Whereas you and I are kind of like, eh, I don't know, doc, thanks for the advice, but I, I don't agree with you. Whereas like them, it's like, but my doctor said. Exactly. Yeah. It's that authority. They just sort of believe it. Yeah. The lab coat God complex. Yeah, exactly. Certainly. And yeah. hopefully that'll change. And I think, uh, you know, again, it, it, there are even laws that are, I think, fundamentally broken. Like, for instance, in the state of Kentucky, when we started doing true diagnostic, you weren't allowed to to order your own labs. If you wanted information, insane. You wanted genetic information, you weren't allowed to order it. Um, <laughs> and without a doctor writing off. And we went to, uh, I remember one of the first things we did was go to the state legislature and, and say, Hey, we think you should be able to order these types of tests on yourself. And they're like, we can't believe you can't do that. It passed overwhelmingly very, very quickly. But, but the, I think those systems are already built into the law, which is pretty incredible. If you're part of the doctor lobby, of course you want that. Mm-hmm. You want Full spectrum control. And Ryan, I mean, you know this, New Jersey and New York still don't allow you yeah. to get your biomarkers done. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, uh, especially in New York, right? Um, it, it can be difficult there, but uh, yeah, I think that that information is your information, right? Of course. I think ultimately it'd be great if you, you know, were, were informed of it. So that's hilarious. I didn't know that about Kentucky, but see, they, see, that's the thing is like, you know, people think it's like this overwhelming Orwellian conspiracy, but in truth, a lot of the times it's just lack of awareness. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. No one's fighting the battles that, 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 that uh, need to be had. They were uh, like, really? Yeah, we'll yeah. fix that. <laughs> so it's really, really refreshing <laughs> here in Kentucky, but I, I imagine it'd be difficult elsewhere. We'll fix that, but it's 40 grand, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, okay, so our first talking point today is again DNA, aging clocks, yeah. and why they're important. And let me just say this. Uh, you know, I started reading a lot of this stuff about bioregulators from like Cavinson and you know, the methylation from Horvath and, and the clock and the aging clock. And I was so fascinated. This is way before your guys' company. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was looking at this stuff like back in 2017 and 2018, and I was blown away at the theories, right? Because now you guys have technology that actually uh, personifies this and, you know, it's real, right? Like you guys have made it real and measurable, but it was always to me like fascinating and a futuristic concept. But kind of just talk about like, you know, how it went from that to where it is now. Yeah, certainly. So um, it really all started in 2013, which is really not that long ago, no. right? Especially when you consider the genetic revolution that's been happening for decades. Um, but that was when the first time Horvath pur- published his first clock. And this clock originally, I always tell people, was not meant to be a medical tool. It was really at first just trying to predict the chronological age of a patient. And so they were doing it for things like crime scene investigations, uh, you know, dating refugees. So this was actually used with the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, where wow. they were taking samples to see how old that person was, if they were adult or minor, and then therefore eligible for asylum. Um, But what they started to do when they applied this to really large cohorts was uh, started to see a little bit of a pattern. And the pattern was that those people who were older than their chronological age with this testing were at more risk for disease outcomes. So they the, they were developing, uh, you know, diseases and, and dying earlier than those people who were younger with this metric than their chronological age. And so even though this was trained to be a chronological age predictor, um, just to predict how old you were or when you were born, it really ended up being a biological age predictor, something that was measuring the underlying biology of aging rather than just the, the number of years you've been alive. And, and that was something that 
it was really unique and novel because it had better associations to outcomes than anything before. So telomeres is always a good example. Those have been, you know, being done for years. And, and this represented a really unique way to measure the biology in, in a way that could really predict those negative outcomes we already know are associated with disease. So that was really the first step um, and a really big one. But then throughout the years, the idea was to make those algorithms better. If you made them any better, they would just get better at predicting your chronological age, which is something we could just ask for, right? We could just ask you your birth date. And so these, these newer algorithms are trained on more specific biological outcomes. So uh, in the case of right now, even over the past few uh, months and weeks, there are now algorithms which can diagnose Alzheimer's, diagnose schizophrenia, yeah. things which yeah. are like preclinical diagnosis. And so our, the idea is that this information about our disease uh, and our, just our body's processes is found in the way that our genes are expressed, whether they're turned on or turned off. And, and we're just trying to read those patterns. And, and definitively, the thing that has still been the biggest is this biological aging measurement. Obviously, a lot of things are happening you know, throughout healthcare, but biological age is what's really pioneered, um, I would say, the, the big data set generations that we're using now. Um, and the algorithms have gotten very, very good at, at telling us how well you're aging. Do you think, and this is a woo-woo question, but you and me can talk about this here on the Jay Campbell podcast. Do you think that, you know, when you start going deep and you talk about two-strand biological organisms versus what, you know, most people theorize in the consciousness space, the Graham Hancocks that were 12-strand DNA, do you think that we were purposely detuned or do you think this is an evolutionarily biologic outcome over time? Tough uh, question, but you're the guy yeah. to answer it. Well, in terms of aging specifically, I, I should yeah. say, uh, you know, why are we seeing those expression patterns? I, I think yeah. that, um, I think that, you know, some people would say it's a lack of, you know, uh, need, once you reproduce, you don't need fitness anymore, and therefore you can sort of decline and decay. But I think that uh, it does look like certain, obviously, certain species live longer, right? So you're, yeah. you know, your bowhead whales, your naked mole rats, and and that's a lot of people are asking the underlying question of why. Um, and I think that uh, I think that that. I, I hold to the tenet that aging is programmed, um, that, uh, yeah. that, that this di species dying off is actually something that has been biologically programmed um, uh, for maybe numerous reasons. It might be yeah. that you need uh, sort of new people to lead every once in a while in, in social dynamics or whatever it might be. But I think that uh, I, I subscribe I think to one of the big theories of aging, which is this hyperfunction theory of aging, which is that we, you know, sort of evolve for all these processes, but then we don't stop that that growth initiation phase and can lead to a lot of issues. Which is why rapamycin is, you know, what I think such a such a good treatment tool and, and one that looks so promising. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but um, dude, when I went down to St. Simon's Islands two summers ago, and I went to the sea turtle aquarium down there, and I'm looking at these sea turtles, and they're 350 years old. Dude. <laughs> Exactly. So, I mean, like, you know, you start seeing things like in the, you know, in the, in the, in, in the, let's just say called the wild mm -hmm. and how they, you know, are evolutionarily living as long as they're living. And then you think of us and like, wow, if a human can live 120 years, they're even by from 100 to 120, they're so physiologically decrepit. Exactly. How the fuck would you even want to be alive? <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like, it is really interesting to see how the yogis, you know, who can sit there in that, you know, lotus position, meditative state and consciously take their energy and leave that body, but yet still keep that body sitting there. Right. You've seen this. Like, I remember, I forgot what the shows were. I think it was, uh, that's incredible. But that guy sat there in that little lotus position for like three years and never moved, you know, his eyes would blink or whatever. So like he could keep him, he kept himself alive, like energetically or spiritually, but his spirit was like off somewhere else. So it, it, it's pretty interesting, like the ability of humans from like a bioenergetic standpoint to actually keep their physical, you know, call it the avatar body keeping going, even though it does seem like right now, you know, what is it? The hay flick limit? Like it's 120 years before a physical body just deteriorates so bad that like, even if you were alive, what would be the purpose? Well, yeah. And I think that that's another really interesting application of this technology though, is to quantify those things, which are hard to quantify. Right. So my, I'm, you know, personally, and I, I hold this as one of my biggest, uh, my biggest 180s, uh, my biggest changes in philosophy. I was never a big fan of meditation and mindfulness. Sure. And until I started this company, you know, I, I used to think, you know, am I doing this right? You know, it, you're you too know, smart, bro. You couldn't <laughs> shut your brain down. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just it was always like, this doesn't seem like it's I'm doing the right thing. Um, and uh, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't have done the biggest 180 because now there have been these studies on biological aging where people yeah. who have better emotional regulation, people who have better, you know, sort of uh, even self control. Um, uh, so these emotional, these these un, 
which to me previously would be very hard to quantify on an individual basis. They have direct inputs onto the aging process yeah. and then therefore the risk of disease. And, and so, uh, you know, seeing this even in my own blood as I've started to implement some of these things um, and seeing some of my, my changes in these aging patterns has been really enlightening and, you know, no pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, like, it's true. I mean, I can share just my own personal experience. You know, I'll be 52 on February 24th, and I'm definitely getting younger. But it's because I spend so much time in stillness. You know, now that I'm down here and I have, like, the tropic sun, you know, I spend 30 minutes sun gazing in the morning. And when I'm sun gazing now, you know, and again, my eyes are closed, right? It's infrared, you know, red light pattern uh, UV. But, like, I'm sitting there and I'm literally, like, imagining or, you know, Call, call it uh, being introspective. I'm visioning what I want that day or that week or that month or whatever it is I'm involved in creating. You know, recently it's been the book and I, everything does slow down and you don't become, you were just talking about the emotional stuff. You know, you don't become as reactive. You become much more proactive. You don't react out of fear. You usually respond out of love or through reason. And it, dude, it is absolutely true. I mean, anyone who does practice these things, you know, whether you want to call it woo woo or not, experiences these profound changes. So there's, it stands to reason that molecularly, you know, through the predictive patterning and behaviors that you guys are now able to observe, uh, all of it does show that by becoming more calm. And again, if we were going to talk about energy and go really full blown, woo, it's like the bioenergetic resonance of the cellular structures allow you to slow all of the processes down. Yeah. I, I certainly believe, you know, and, and it, we're leading to a more unified theory where those yes. things be easily quantified yes. and, and, and you understand how it all impacts. We just recently did a study um, with even electromagnetic field blockers. People were using them whenever they were going to sleep and looking at some of those changes. And, and the changes are surprising, I think, um, in terms of, you know, how much it, it means uh, for things that you, you don't even think about or don't even quantify on a daily basis. Um, and so I think that, uh, again, we're starting to now be able to look at the biological significance of a lot of these things to have that more unified theory. Well, I would love for you guys at some point to do studies on like, what is 5G really doing to sell your life? Right, right. Because we're past the realm of conspiracy theory now. You can go on PubMed. And you can look at what 5G dissonant frequencies do to the ecosphere. You can see the bird life that is dying off. I mean, there's all sorts of studies now that prove this. You know, what's the guy that wrote the book? Um, I know you know the name of the book, but he looks at the the the, the energy si signature since, fuck, what is his name? What's the, the, the electric universe, or not the electric universe, yeah. the electric rainbow, Arthur Furstenberg. His, yeah. his book is profound in like measuring since like 1906 every advance in energy structures on the planet, right? It went from the radio wave and then it went into Wi-Fi and stuff. And you can see ecologically, there are various die-offs of certain biological species every time we intensify the energy signature, right? So it's like, this is not woo-woo. This is not conspiracy theory. We are seeing this around the planet. But as you said, we don't have studies on human life yeah. and what 5G or Wi-Fi or even just old school cell phones yeah. are well, really doing to us. You know, it's certainly interesting and in, uh, because uh, we, we have a, a couple data points, I think, that would allow us to do that uh, relatively well. One thing that we've done that's interesting is we can even, from people who, who take our test, we know their zip code because we obviously sent out their test. And, and we, so we can even look at, uh, estimate where, they've, where they're from from a zip code basis based on the level of pollution that they're wow. exposed to. Um, so in the pollution markers in the air, so the particulate matter exposure, whether or not there's, you know, uh, more microplastics in, the, in those environments. And so, um, so th those are all affecting their epigenome. And, and so a study like that might be very interesting to look at the places where 5G was rolled out first, uh, you know, and then just associate that with the zip code basis. Dude, um, I don't think anybody wants to know Ryan. It's so funny you just said microplastics because a doctor that you and I both know sent me a study this morning. I, I don't even know. Let me just look this right while I'm talking to you because it's like perfect timing, but it was from this morning. Uh, I think it's Harvard. Uh, hold on. Uh, microplastic used in food packaging and paint are found in live human veins for the first time. It's from, uh, yeah, it's from Science and Technology at Harvard. It was published in the Daily Mail today. What do you feel without going conspiratorial like what are the ramifications of the microplastics now in people's blood oh i've i i don't know i it, it certainly can't be good though i know that <laughs> i mean we've i mean we've uh looked at like uh you know all these these uh you know, sort of forever chemicals right the pfa mm -hmm. those things 
and it's very clearly aging um, as well as has a lot of association to disease. But, you know, whenever we're talking about even the physical impacts, right, like physically, what does, does this tissue does these microplastics accumulate in, in our tissues, right? Are they, how are they, you know, uh, affecting all those different things? I, it, it's terrifying, especially because you can't get away from it. Are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. I'm literally looking at the summary and it says a new study from the University of Hull suggests microplastics can pass through blood vessels to vascular tissue. But it is not clear what the implications are for human health. It's like it's like the Bruce Willis and Die Hard. What do you think I'm ordering a pizza? <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, I think you could speculate. It's probably not good. Um, I, I think that's it's probably, probably <laughs> not good. Oh my god, dude! All right, I took us off the rabbit hole. Um, oh, yeah. So then, with the clocks, like, what were the biggest issues previously, and how is that now fixed with your guys' tech? Yeah, I think a lot of people were easily disillusioned with some of these early clocks because they would take a test and then they'd implement everything they could to try and improve their aging rates and then have a score go up. And 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 so one of the biggest issues was precision. Um, you know, how how precise is that test? I don't say accuracy because whenever these newer clocks, they're trained to these biological phenotypes, right? Not just chronological age. And so accuracy is, I think, how well is it is it able to predict aging phenotypes? But the precision is is how accurate is the test itself. If you take the exact same blood sample and test it twice. What's the variation? Um, and, and for some of these original algorithms, they had up to you know four years of variation um, between some of those algorithms, maybe even more. And I think that really disillusioned a lot of people to the clock is saying, hey, this isn't reflecting what I'm doing. I, I'm trying to change my life. And, and now that precision has, has definitively been improved. Um, and so now we getting less than you know a, really a 1% variance if we take, take the exact same sample. So it's very, very precise, especially even more precise than some of the standards of, of other testing, like traditional blood testing or hormone testing. Um, and so, uh, so the precision now has been fixed, which is really great for N of one, right? The, the reason people are doing this in the first place is to find out what works for them, right? You know, you and I both might take metformin. It might help me. It might hurt you. But by doing this, we can actually see what it's doing to our right. aging rates. And, and with that variation, you weren't able to do that previously. So that's been, I would say, probably one of the biggest issues. So um, how close are you guys to integrating this, though, like in every clinical? Because, look, if I'm and, and I'm, you know, just speaking from the. Uh, pulpit here, but if I'm a physician mm -hmm. and I'm working in health optimization, yeah. like I don't want to work with a single patient until I know their biological age. You know, you know, I want a Dr. Anthony J. I want a Ryan Smith to evaluate my DNA. I want to look at my polymorphisms. I want to know, you know, every perceived or you know possible you know long term outcome. Before I start down the road of like, you know, adjuvants like hormonal or therapeutic yeah. peptides or, you know, growth hormone or any of these things, right? Because it's much better to know than to not know. Yeah, certainly. And and I think that, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to be on this moving trend. I mean, yeah. people like the American Cancer Association are now saying use biological aging phenotypes instead of chronological age. That's and amazing. And so it's it's great. I mean, really established, you know, disease oriented people are saying this is the the, the future. Even if, if you look at sort of some of these social programs, we know that, for instance, children who have uh, you know adverse childhood experiences or are brought up in low socioeconomic status that they age faster as a result of of some of these things. And so uh, even how I think we view the how we want to structure society and, and you know equal opportunity, I think it's all reflected in these biological processes. And so so it's now starting to become at least considered in world wide application. But the thing that's been holding it back, at least to this point, is that aging is not considered a disease by the FDA, which <laughs> really is, uh, you know, it, it's hard to, to navigate around because uh, it, for us, it, it allows us to do these tests in a commercial fashion, which is great, uh, you know, because we, it's not a disease. But I think fundamentally, we all believe it is a disease and are really trying to get it considered that way. So we can actually implement it into these medical systems and fix the initial problem we talked about earlier. It's funny, as you said that, it's not a disease. I was thinking of like Wilford Brim Brimley in the movie Cocoon. <laughs> we're not going to get old and we're not going to die. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the vision, right? That's the I, mean, but it's, I mean, how could you not say it's a disease? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, again, and I don't want to go, you know, Christian fundamentalism on it, but I mean, the Bible, you know, they talked about Methuselah. They talked about Noah. They talked about all these people 
again, you know, whether or not you believe any of this or not, that we're living seven, 800, 900 years. Now, again, I don't know what happened. I don't care. It's we're not, not the purpose to talk about on the show, but bro, there's no reason to think that we can't live longer and stronger. Yeah. I mean, you and I are both, you know, using everything at the, but the kitchen sink, if not the kitchen sink, <laughs> you know, to, to, to enhance our cognition, to strengthen our bodies, to lower our body fats, to enhance our immunity, you know, to make us impervious to biological weapons and everything else they throw at us. So it's like, it's silly to think that you can't eventually extrapolate with all of those things that we're doing to enhance that it's not going to ultimately extend life. So I, I mean, it's mind blowing. It's even like, you know, you, you, you see all the data we know about metformin and you still see the doubters, you know, I told you, or, you know, I know you're, you read my stuff, but like, yeah. I was blown away that, you know, people are still doubting metformin. It's the most studied medication in the history of man. And yes, there are different, you know, ontological differences. Some people have polymorphisms and maybe metformin will exacerbate. But at this point, the great majority of people get benefit for so many reasons, right? Yes, there's a small subset that don't. But the fact that the medical industry still, well, there's not enough data. What are you talking about? We have people <laughs> who live longer on who are destroying their physical bodies, di type two diabetics who there's like a hundred studies that show that people destroying themselves as type two diabetics with metformin live longer than non-diabetics without metformin. So, I mean, it's like you can't extrapolate that. Now I know that's rabbit holing here, but dude, no, I, I think it brings up a good point, which is that I think whenever people think about this fight against aging, we also want to shift it away that you don't have to think that you have to live to 150, 100, right. 200 years. You can think of small incremental increases as really positive things. I think that everyone who's had a family member, maybe, you know, pass away probably says, you know, if I had a little bit more time with them. And so I don't, I mean, right. even things that have, uh, you know, a, a mild effect size, uh, you know, we shouldn't be seeing at this point in time our, you know, our, our average lifespan decrease. And that's what we're seeing. And so I think that, you know, trying to phrase these and, and you know, set expectations, of course, I think if we could, I, I do believe that we're, we're coming where we can make massive increases in lifespan. I think we're getting to that point. But I also don't think that we have to hold that as our standard for ourselves to see improvement. We can, we can certainly, you know, do these, these, you know, incremental things, which we, we know have an effect and, and still expect that to have a big difference. It's qualitative, not quantitative. And yeah. it is happening. There's 100% it's happening. You and I both know tons of people who are getting younger, who are regressing, you know, quote unquote, age-related disease and age-related lifestyle factors. But again, it's a choice, right? Like yeah. you have to be the one on your end who doesn't, you know, pound alcohol or eat McDonald's, you know, yeah. and, and pound Doritos and Mountain Dew and all that stuff. You still have to choose, you know, those various interventions in addition to you know, the various lifestyle adjuvants that we recommend and talk about all the time, which we're about to get into that meat and potatoes That's right now. But I mean, look, dude, at the end of the day, it still is the bifurcation. You know, it's the person who is willing to spend whatever mm -hmm. to live the longest and the strongest. And like you just said, it's not about 150. It's about living to 80, 90, 100 and being robust exactly. and functional in those quote unquote later years versus, you know, the guy who's like living at 103 in an apartment and can't move and, you know, can barely chew and his bones are all decrepit and stuff like that. So right. I think people just have to make a decision for themselves. Like, what is my end game? You know, right. am I wanting to be in my eighties and climbing mountains in the West or yeah. picking up my grandkids without, you know, breaking some p part of my vertebrae in my lower back. You know what I mean? So it's like everybody just has to choose what path they want to take. Yeah, certainly. And, and there's one, one, I want to fix that misconception too, because now with a lot of these aging algorithms, I think if people used to say exactly what you said, right? Do I even want to live a uh, life in a nursing home when I'm, you know, 90 years old? Like, is that, is that important? And these new aging algorithms are, are showing one really important thing, which is that the people who score better on the aging algorithms don't just live longer and live longer without disease. They also live better quality of life. Right. I'm talking about things like perceptual reason, mental totally. processing speed. We're talking, you know, muscle mass and grip strength, uh, the, you know, walking speed, VO2 max, all of these functional measurements and, and they're even you know acti activities of daily living like you know being able to, to stand or lift up your kids or you know some of those other things they all score better and so these things are not you know uh, mutually exclusive if you're improving your aging you're reducing your risk of disease and death but you're also improving your quality of life exactly well said you're a man of few words but powerfully <laughs> profound statements okay so now we're getting into the meat and potatoes and stuff that you and i really want to talk about which is what interventions are we seeing as the best for aging? You already mentioned rapamycin. We talked about metformin. Let's go deeper down the rabbit hole. 
Like, what are you seeing? Not peptides like super advanced coming, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I've been looking at Retro True Tide, right? <laughs> Which is like this super advanced version of Monjaro. But, yeah, but yeah. like, you know, give me some other things that maybe the average person doesn't really know about. Yeah. So, well, I, I think first and foremost, a lot of what we know so far is coming from these large epidemiological trials, yeah. right? Really big amounts of people asking them about their behaviors and, you know, associations and seeing what, what sticks. And so those, those things have been very, very informative and, and tell us a lot, uh, right? You know, the things like the impacts of certain diseases, uh, you know, and how that might accelerate the aging process. Um, we also have some of those which are interventional trials, which I think are very interesting and, and really highlight, you know, what I think is one of the biggest things that is very easy to fix, which is just your stress level. And we sort of already talked about this in terms of, you know, mindfulness and, and uh, you know, sort of emotional regulation and, 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 and meditation, but stress reduction period has improvements on the aging process. I think, uh, you know, one example maybe everyone has seen is how these presidents age while in office, right? You know, you go in and, uh, and, and come out looking very, very different, but I think that the stress plays a major impact. And so I couldn't skip over that one as, as, uh, you know, mundane Definitely. as it is, um, you know, it plays a major, major impact. I think that, um, any of the mTOR inhibitors, um, anything that's inhibiting mTOR like rapamycin, like caloric restriction, um, I think, are very effective um, at, 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 at improving some of these age-related phenotypes. Um, so I think that that's probably the one we would also recommend to everyone. Um, and then another one that's relatively common, but we see really positive increases with is DHEA, um, really across our cohort. And, and many of you are, might know DHEA is sort of that a hormone which declines with age. Um, and so, uh, but, but I think that it has a lot of other factors, including limiting some of those cortisol stress related pathways. Um, and so those are three things that I think everyone could do. Just eat less, you know, um, uh, try and reduce your stress and supplement with the DHEA. And, and that is generally a really good start. Well said, well said. Okay, so beyond that, yeah. Um, you know, cause obviously that's why you're on this podcast. <laughs> you know, you and I have, you know, probably were one of the first again, dude, it's crazy to think that this was 2016. I'm mind blown, but you're right, dude. Cause I remember now sitting in that office that I had in West Covina with that broken speaker. <laughs> remember you and I did an amazing podcast and I, and we had like a hundred comments or like, you know, dude, if you could just, if somebody could actually just hear what the hell you were saying, <laughs> you're like, thank God Ryan was not speaking into a broken microphone. But you remember when we recorded that entire podcast and my yeah. freaking microphone was broken and I had no idea. I also did it one time with Dr. Rob yeah. and that was a disaster too. But, uh, but anyway, uh, bottom line is we're now in 2023, right? Like people that have bifurcated that follow people like you and yeah. me they're dude, they just want us to tell them like, what is the new yeah. thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, how can I improve? I'm already at level nine. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. listening to you two guys because I want to be at level 11. Right. So like, what do I, what can I do? What's out there right now that I can get to level 11? Yeah. So there, there's quite a bit, you know, I think that's something <laughs> I'm, I'm most excited about And again, we could probably talk for you know, 31 hours. minutes in bro. You got <laughs> 29 minutes and I'm cutting you off. No, that, you know, I think that, um, Oh, I don't even know where to start. So there's for people might not know this, but there's a, uh, uh, there's a trial called the ITP trial from, uh, university of Michigan. And, and this is actually looking at mice and testing just a lot of drugs to see what happens to their longevity. Um, and so this is one I always like to point out because uh, obviously they've shown a lot of improvements with rapamycin, not surprising, but there's a couple other things on that list, which are a little bit interesting and a little bit novel and unique. And so, um, you know, one of the first ones that I always like to bring up is, is actually a type of estradiol, right? 17 alpha estradiol, um, which particularly showed lifespan increases in men. Um, and this is not frequently used in, in the integrated space, but we're starting to see data sets here. Bro, there's a lot of doctors do use this. You know, Dr. Ken, yeah. what's his name in Texas uses this. Dr. Kenny Wilgers is on my show. He, he raves about this, by the way. Yeah. And it doesn't, so people think estrogen or hear estrogen. They think all these, you know, uh, aromatizing. Hey, estrogen, I don't want right? to have estrogen. <laughs> Especially for men, right? But but it doesn't have any of those estrogenizing uh, sort of effects. It's a very selective uh, receptor. And in the initial data, particularly in older men, the older that you are, it looks even more positive, seems to have an age reduction effect. Estradiol confers protection to biological systems. So how would it not? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, uh, 
Yeah. And so I think that one's a little known. I mean, everyone, I think, has heard this hormone replacement narrative now, which, which, uh, but, but I think very little people know about that particular type of estrogen, 17 alpha estradiol, which looks really, really promising. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there are a couple other supplements, uh, type things that, that came from that trial. Um, and, uh, you know, one we call NHDG, um, which is a norhydro, uh, acid. Um, that also looked to be pretty good. You know, I think that from a supplement, at least on the market right now, it's probably a little bit too expensive to dose a similar dose, but um, that looked interesting. And then, you know, one of my- Market goes up. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it will. As people start to use it, it's going to become way more widely available. So keep your eye out on that one. And, and uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that uh, I get the spelling to you, Jay, so oh, you cool. can have, have that to everyone else. But uh, and then, you know, I think one other one that that I've been talking about for a while, I think everyone is on these S, uh, GL2, I should say, the GLP1 inhibitors, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like you yeah. mentioned. Yep. They're, they're, you know, from the tears of a tide to the semaglutide or the, the Mongerno, uh, you know, these are, I mean, everyone's talking about it now. The New York Times, they're publishing all these articles. It's unreal, dude. Joe, yeah. I heard Joe Rogan just did some quack nonsense last week about how, like, people were losing right. muscle from using semaglutide. That's BS. Only, well, probably because they're, they're eating less, <laughs> maybe, but. I mean, uh, I mean that's yeah. definitely possible, right? But I mean, yeah. like, you and I both have been using this. Well, remember, a year ago, it was actually longer than a year ago, you, you turned me on to semaglutide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I literally saw you at A4M and, you know, yeah. we always, you know, sometimes we spend longer together and other times we don't, you know, we won't save those stories for, like, you got to know us personally for those stories. Yeah. All right. But, uh, but, you know, you said, you told me about it and then I immediately reached yeah. out to my clinical friends and I said, send me some and I started using it and it was unreal. And then after that, it was like Tessa fencing I started using and yeah. I started, you know, and you can expound on this, but I started using Monjero, which again is terzapatide at that time. I'm yeah. pronouncing it correctly, uh, effectively in October. And bro, I have never in my life ever used anything like that before. I am more lean, put it this way. I am leaner now in the same way than I ever was previous to this. Like when I was competing as, in, as a physique athlete in my early forties, I could never get this lean. And the metabolic uncoupling, again, combined with the GLP-1 uh, appetite suppression, it's unreal. And, you know, I, as you know, it's in the book because you helped edit it and stuff. But the, re- the Rita True Tide is already through clinical stage two clinical trials. And looking at that data, bro, if that is real and that really does come to the market, I mean, I see that revolutionizing yeah. the fat loss, you know, metabolic dysregulation space because it right. only burns pure fat and it has right. right now no side effects clinically noted. Yeah. I mean, I remember this is this is what we were talking about even in 2016 where we're talking about the growth of peptides, right? All of those products you're just mentioning are peptides which are, you know, overcoming the issues with peptides, which has been generally they're not easily bioavailable. You have to take them with small half-lives, right? That's what happened from the liraglutide to the semaglutide. You went from once daily to once weekly, uh, right? And, and now we're just seeing these improvements to get the mechanism of action even clearer, more more precise um, with less side effects, right? And so, so all these things we talked about from a peptide growth perspective are now happening in in big pharma in, in these areas and, and having massive impacts. And so, yeah, the G, and actually at A4M, you know, I think uh, over a year ago, that was really my second or third week on the semi I know, I know. It's and, always like, it, yeah, like it's crazy. It's, speed, you're like, bro, it's unreal. And I'm yeah, like, okay. Well, I, yeah, I remember I went to, to breakfast one of those days and-, and You didn't like, need anything. I didn't need an egg, yeah. <laughs> and tried to, after a workout. It, Are you using therapeutic peptides? Are you a new user? Maybe an advanced user? Maybe you're considering starting peptides. Highly recommend going to the link right below the peptidescourse.com forward slash 10 dash mistakes and download my PDF and learn what not to do before starting therapeutic peptides. Let's be honest and let's unpack this. I mean, you and I both know the less you eat, the longer you're going to live. It's Mm -hmm. absolutely a fact. Now, what the importance of this is, is like what you just said, like you can't go to a place where you stop eating food altogether, right? You exactly. still got to train, you know, yeah. you still have to exercise, you know, you have to use exercise memetics, yeah. you have to live insulin controlled, all these things that we already know. But I would just say, and I want your opinion on it. I have not noticed them being so profound that you don't eat, right? It just yeah. stops you from overeating, which is the holy grail. Exactly. I think I think that's exactly right. It, it allows you to make the better decision, right? Exactly. Which is, I, I think, uh, and and you and, and also 
changes what you want to eat from a, and, and so I, I'll go in now to more protein lean, yes. food, right? More yeah. vegetables, yeah. you know, make less yeah. carbs, um, you know, and, and so that's my personal. Uh, in the same way. Uh, yeah. I genuinely crave sea bass with broccoli and sweet potatoes. Whereas in the past I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. You know what I mean? Where it's like your body, it, it really does. It forces your body to yeah. eat cleaner foods, more sustenance, more fuel-based food. And, you know, I was going to just make a joke because what you're saying is just, unfortunately, there's one unfortunate side effect of Monjero, which again is there's appetite. It's, I don't have those amazing Denny's all you can eat Saturday morning moments anymore, bro. <laughs> exactly. I used to. I used to love finishing a workout where I worked hard, ready to reward myself with this. You literally <laughs> eat ten pancakes. <laughs> and you can't happened. do it anymore. <laughs> Which again I, is, is a good thing, and if it helps you, you know, further those narratives, then then great. Um, and so I'm all for insulin. I, I mean, insulin sensitivity. But um, you know, to go back, I think to the other part of that ITP trial. I think that a lot of people are also looking, overlooking some of the effects of the SGL2 inhibitors as a potential thing. And, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, things like uh, canagliflozin, you know, these, these things which basically make your kidneys permeable to glucose so that you can excrete the glucose, um, I think is, is also really promising in that trial. And it might be for the caloric restriction. It might be that you're just consuming less calories or getting rid of, you know, more calories, or it could be an entirely different mechanism in the first place. But, um, but it also looks to be super positive. So I, I, I think- just, But are the are those, I mean, I know they're not widely as known. I mean, I know about them through you and some other docs, but I mean, are, is anybody really using them? Are they widely available clinically right now? So they're, they're prescriptive and available, but but most people are preferring the the GLP ones, um, and because you know they're multi mechanism action, um, and they sometimes have less side effects um, depending on uh, on the individual. But also, it's more expensive. Um, but but I think that there's probably a world where I think you mix those therapies, much yeah. like you're doing yeah. some of the pesofensine for some of those. Uh, I would say neuro, some of the neurological control. Yeah. You know, in, in addition to the you know the uh, nor, norepinephrine and nor uh, uh, adrenaline increases to increase met metabolic rate. I think there's probably a mixture of some a lot of these things that sh which you can find preferred mechanism of action for each of them. And so I do, you know, I think the SGL2 inhibitors are one that are high on my list um, for, for longevity as well. Um, and then uh, it would be, you know, I think secondary to, to some of those other things, but there, there's actually one of the things you talked about in the book, which I think is also worth bringing up um, because I know that this is unreleased data. Um, and that is that the 5-amino-1-MQ, particularly with the Horvath clock in muscle tissue and in muscle tissue specific clocks reverses the biological age of muscle tissue. Unreal. Um, and, and so I know that this was again, unpublished data, but uh, I'm hoping it'll come out here relatively soon um, to show. And, and again, from, from a mechanism of action, we're not necessarily sure, but uh, you know, I think that obviously we know that NAD increases or have been, you know, one of those well-studied things for longevity, especially if you're NAD deficient, um, then it, you know, can have a major impact. And I think that the five amino one MQ is another one of those things that I get particularly excited about. Maybe not this particular mo molecule. Um, I, I certainly like it, but uh, I think that there are better solutions, next generation products of the same nature coming out here in the very near future. Let's talk about 5-amino-1 because you and I haven't had this conversation. Now, again, for those that you don't that don't know, Ryan actually gave me 5-amino <laughs> back in 2017 or 2018. I think I was literally the first biohacker slash influencer to actually have access to that. And it was so profound for me within 60 days. And again, as you know, it's subtle because mm -hmm. if you're not changing your lifestyle and you just start using it, you get in increased endurance, more explosive uh, movement patterning, you know, depending on the, your performance or your sport or whatever, but it also just literally adds skeletal mass mm -hmm. without an increase in like caloric intake. I mean, I've never experienced anything like that, but as I said to you, and I know you also experienced this similarly, it right. seems to downregulate I don't know if that's due to receptor attenuation. I don't know if it's just because your body is so dynamic and it's homeostatic and it just eventually stops. So maybe you're, cause again, a lot of people still use it, but you, you know, we're four years later now. Yeah. What are your thoughts on five amino one as far as like, how should you use it? How should you stack it? What are dosages? Yeah. Um, just, you know, extrapolate. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that most people heard about 5-amino-1-Q at least first for its NAD action, right? Yeah. For, for keeping things in the NAD salvage pathway. But then I think shortly thereafter, people started to use it. People started to see these muscle increases. And then sure enough, we saw a study that showed, you know, after muscle injury, uh, you know, uh, mice who'd done the 5-amino-1-Q had, had twice the cross-sectional muscle fiber areas as those who did not take it. Um, and so it showed this muscle recovery and muscle stimulation effect um, as well. And I so I think that, uh, 
I would I had a very similar experience where I first used it and was honestly shocked. Uh, <laughs> I remember we were talking about it. Like, Dude, I was dunking in warm-ups. No. I was like, what's going I, yeah, on? I, I hadn't, I hadn't probably been able to dunk for at least a year before uh, I was doing this. And then it was easy uh, all of a sudden and nothing else in my life changed. Um, and, and, you know, actually that's one of the very few instances where nothing in my life, had, you know, <laughs> added or, or anything of that nature. But I, so, so I was fairly confident, you know, that it was the five minute one in Q. And I think that I have had less responses, um, but I'm looking actually right now to quantify this. So we're actually um, doing, this is not, I would say our main focus at True Diagnostic, but uh, we are starting to do NAD plus testing here in nice. our real lab. And the reason being is that I think that we had tried to do a lot of the, the NAD testing with available uh, you know, suppliers on the market and just get got results that didn't make a lot of sense. And so we went and tried to find someone who could do it. And there was a group in Finland who did it. So we're actually going to be looking at the comparison of NAD levels um, in in older adults, so 55 and above, who are doing 5-amino-1-MQ as one intervention, who are doing NAD infusions as one intervention, then the nicotinamide riboside and the nicotinamide mononucleotide. And I'm hoping that that might also then give us a, a marker which we can associate with some of that response, right? That does it downregulate after a while? Do we see decreases in intracellular NAD after two weeks of uses, for instance, or something of that nature? Um, and so I, so I think that, uh, you know, from a it, it, most people who have been using the five amino, it's still very anecdotal. It's all, yeah, anecdotal. it's all anecdotal. But I would still say that I think from the from the responses that I've heard, uh, the first response is always the strongest. And I think after that, it it can leave a, a little bit be, to be desired for that same response. But would you say from a t- you know because people are going to be like Jay, you know you and J- you Ryan, you guys are so smart, you talk around. Th- you know, no, we're not talking around. I'll just make it really clear. But I mean, would you still say that like four to six weeks is as long as you'd stay on it before taking the same amount of time off? Yeah, and I, I think maybe even slightly less. Um, yeah, the only sure. reason being, sure. it, sure. yeah, it is because uh, you know what? It's, you, for most five amino one Q, it's cofactor is or essentially yeah. salt iodine, right? Um, and you don't want to o- overdose on iodine either. I mean, a lot of people are still deficient. Dude, that's like such a big thing now. People yeah. message me every day. What about iodine? Yeah, <laughs> and so you don't. Tell the you new don't kids, want to the ion, keep right? it regular. Yeah. And, and and so uh, you know, too much of it can be a bad thing, right? And uh, and and I think that you don't want that to accumulate. Um, so so just something I think that shorter might be better for that reason alone. Yeah, stock up on iodine for when the nukes come, guys. You know, you, you can use that when you're contaminated. Uh, but that's interesting. So you're really saying then, really for five amino, use it for three weeks at most, maybe four, but like yeah. you know, and then equal time off, correct? Yeah, certainly. And, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try and, and also time it from those, I would say performance areas in my life. But, uh, you know, when I'm not doing the caloric restriction, when I'm not doing mTOR inhibition, exactly. I try to go more of the amp kinase route, you know, more of the stimulation, um, and performance, then I'll, I'll certainly, you know, uh, do it during those times and try and try and cycle. Uh, I think as you know, moderation of both is, is probably important. It's all about the gains, bro. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I got it. Um, well, so I think before I let you go again, amazing podcast, let's just, talk a little bit about peptide stacking. I think that this is a really lost understanding or cause of most people because you just kind of said it, you know, everything is, and you know, I know this, and of course you know this, but like everything is always related to like one specific goal, right? Like if your goal is to build mass, five amino, excess food, excess carbohydrates, build, you know, maybe take a growth hormone or GNH or RH or ipamorelin, a, a, a tessamorelin, a CGC, if you have access to pharma gr- growth hormone and, of course, you know, a low growth of testosterone, build muscle. But it's always caloric related. Now we're going to talk about losing fat. But, dude, so many people and, and caloric restriction, less carbohydrates, more insulin controlled. But so many people think, that, you know, and I know you've heard this even with clinicians, but, that you, you know, you can do this stack for this and then you can do this stack for that at the same time. And it's like, no, you can't. Like, what is your specific goal? Then build your peptide protocol or array around that specific goal. But dude, so many people, they read the, you know our books, they read our information, and then they freak out because they're like, oh my God, you know, I got a shoulder injury and I got a little bit too much belly fat, but I got to put on muscle. And yeah. so it's like all of a sudden they want to do six peptides stacking oh, yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's hard because you also don't know what's working for you, right? And 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 uh, it's a you know I always add the things one on one, but I agree, goal focused, right? You've got to go in goal focused. So many physicians, I think, you know, in the making money and uh, under you know obviously paying their bills like everybody else, you know, they get into the value add mindset, and then they're before you know it, their customer just bought eight peptides. 
And, you know, they're attempting to use them because this is like the number one question that I get, you know, literally from people when it comes to peptides is like, what can I stack with what? And so obviously, as you know, we have a section in the book of like when you can stack, like when does BPC and TB500 for an acute injury make sense without stopping whatever it is, whether you're in a fat loss phase or a muscle, you know, uh, gain phase, or maybe you're just, you want to use TB500 and BPC and you're going to use a nootropic pep, yeah. right? So, I mean, it's like people have to just understand there's a time and a place, but it's not like taking eight peptides at one time and trying to tackle four different specific areas of your body, you know, that are all subsequently different. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think that uh, there's always an interplay biologically, right? Between all of these processes, you even look at some of the, uh, some of the things like dihexa, which interact with BDNF and, you know, those even have <laughs> circadian rhythm cycles. So knowing when, you know, uh, if you want to get really advanced, it can, you can go down a rabbit hole. And so I think that's why focusing on, on particular outcomes, as you mentioned, is, is so important because you don't have to worry about confliction and you can make sure you actually know what's working for you. So what are your thoughts? Cause I can't let you go without yeah. asking you on, um, Monjero on terzapatide. And before you say, so now, you know, I'm now in month four. Uh, and by the way, just so you know, too, I've been, you know, because I'm in Mexico now, it's harder for me to get <laughs> certain things. Uh, I will rotate semaglutide with terzapatide um, just to spray some out. And honestly, bro, like, I feel amazing on these. But like, are you, you know, because again, people ask me these questions. Have you noticed any side effects other than, you know, reduced appetite, less food consumption? Um, that, you know, should be something like it, it, both in the clinical literature and in yourself and using them? Um, I haven't. Uh, I Me neither. Other, other than the typical GI, you know, related issues. Yeah, uh, smaller poop. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's, 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 yeah. that's obviously what is part of this, right? Because you're not eating as much food. So your bowel, the roughage, all that stuff, you just don't have as large bowel movements. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I think that the, the satiety, the less food, you know, I think that Really, no. And and one of my big concerns was it, at least at first, was, you know, especially whenever you do these hormone therapies. So like testosterone is a good example. If you want to get off testosterone, you can't expect, you know, for your body to start taking testosterone the day you get off. And so right. one of my questions was, you know, what happens when you stop? Um, you know, and, and 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 so I ask a lot of clinicians this, and I think people generally gain back weight, but it's not due to a biochemical mechanism as much as behavioral. I think totally. switching back to some of those other behavioral, um, you know, changes. Um, I think that you know a lot of people can establish a new insulin sensitivity and then sort of, you know, continue that. Um, so long as they keep up the same behaviors as it relates to, to their, their diet and nutrition. Um, so I think that, uh, even I, what I was even maybe a little bit worried about originally, I have no worries about now, even if you stop it, I think that, uh, you tend, and I've, I've done this for now for six months, uh, and then restarted it and, and, and really didn't, I would say, see any negative side effects that would worry me about even stopping this therapy. Bro, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the most profound advancement that I've seen in the realm of, of body fat loss, weight loss. It's sustainable. I mean, look, all the people that I've, you know, from my influence have gotten on, uh, Terza have said to me that for one month after stopping, they still controlled. And that it wasn't until 30 days and, and, and it's almost universal that I felt like my appetite returned to where it was. So, I mean, like, you're right. Like if we start looking at this over time, what an amazingly profound change to be able to know that like you literally can go on this for four to six months, dramatically drop body fat, you know, reduce uh, risk factors for disease of aging. And then to stop, you still have like a timeline to acclimate where you're, you still won't consume too much food. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Right. It's, it's a great tool to establish a normal or, or healthy biological cycle, right? Dude, if, if I can't even pronounce it, it's called Reta True Tide. That's what it's again. It's, 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 it's I think it's Lily. Uh, they're doing this too. I mean, again, when you start looking at the clinical data from the trials, it burns pure fat. And it's all three areas, right? It's uncoupling, it's the GLP 1, and it's the GIP. So, I mean, like, it's yeah. the perfect metabolic fat loss drug for everyone. I mean, I can't even imagine when this comes out. And again, so far from what I've read, there's no side effects. It's the yeah. same as Monjero. I mean, some people, some Monjero people say that they get the nausea feeling. And again, I think it's from lack of food. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a small yeah. person, small bone, you don't have a big appetite. Maybe you don't eat all of a sudden for a day and you're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like you yeah, got yeah. an autophagic response and you don't feel good. You wake up in the middle of the night and you got to go to the bathroom. But I, I don't notice any side effects. But when I look at Reta True Tide, it's literally burning yeah. purely fat stores on the body. 
Yeah. And I know you've been a big fan of those uncouplers for a while, uh, or I should say, you know, interested in that science. So this is, you know, a, a good, good, uh, you know, pentultimate uh, conclusion to that. I mean, I can't even believe it. I mean, they're saying it's going to be here by summer of this year. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, I'd love to get some experience, um, you know, and, and for what it's worth, even the epigenetics can even, uh, there was a great study published uh, showing that it can predict the outcomes of metformin use. Are you likely to have side effects or are you likely to respond with HbA1c reduction? And so I think that uh, even the met, even the, these uh, epigenetic profiles might even predict if you're going to have a good response or which of these medications you should even go on in the first place. Amazing, man. Listen, if somebody wants to work with you, connect with you, uh, do a podcast with you. What is the best way for them to do that now? Yes. Uh, reach out to me via email at Ryan at True Diagnostic. Uh, if you have a question about sort of our technology or tech, we, we, we'd we love to, to help out. And, uh, you know, we still obviously, personally, I, I dabble in the world of optimization. Uh, and so if there's questions I can answer there, always happy to put you in the right direction. Awesome, man. Well, look, guys, uh, you guys know, obviously, I'm a big supporter of them. If you go on my blog or on my website now, you know, there's a link you can go to True Diagnostic and save 50 bucks off of it. I highly recommend all of you guys do that. It's again, True Diagnostic dot com forward slash j dash campbell and go to my landing page and take 50 bucks off but i mean like you know i'm hopeful that at some point soon uh you guys set up some sort of deal with like every health optimization cl clinician in the united states where it's just like a part of their package because i mean there's no reason to not you know to have this kind of obscurity anymore when you have the data you know to be able to do everything for you yeah, certainly. And we're about to come up with a ton of publications that we've been working on for a long time that I'm very excited about. So if you're interested in the biological aging space, certainly pay attention. We've got some great work we're coming out with, uh, worked for over now two and a half years with Harvard on. I'm very excited. It should be around here March or February. So uh, always uh, happy to share that when it comes out. Yeah. And you better send it to me in advance. All right, guys and gals, remember, support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell, Jay Campbell podcast. Go to truediagnostic.com. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.